Okay, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online, and just we're, I'm excited about this message, and uh, I just think God's going to, I pray that God's really going to use it. Just want to make one little uh, note before I get started here. You know, I had COVID about three or four weeks ago, and I'm fine, obviously I'm fine, um, but I have lingering congestion, and it doesn't really bother me until I speak. So sometimes when I start speaking, it gets stirred up. So I just wanted to say that in case I, you know, the last two weeks I've, I've started crying, you know, not, not literally crying, but the congestion has made my eyes water. And also, you know, so I just want to just, just say that. So maybe the, the grace of God will be with me so that it doesn't affect me. But if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 12 and, uh, as I mentioned last Sunday, the Lord changed my message last Sunday. Um, I shared about that last Sunday from a series we were in, and, to, and then the Lord just all of a sudden just like just shifted this to Revelation chapter 12. I believe Revelation chapter 12 is a very, very important prophecy for the hour that we live in. Um, you know, and again, I said this last Sunday, but just to say it again, one of the challenges you have in teaching Revelation chapter 12 is I have I've spent about 20 plus years studying this and you know I've taught it a lot in our church but you're trying to condense down into 45 minutes to an hour uh, just 20 years of study so you're probably not going to get everything and the other thing that's challenging is some people have never heard it so they're looking at me like what are you talking about and other people have heard it and they're like okay keep keep it on so I'm going to just ask the Lord to give us all grace. So if there's things you have not heard, if there's things you have never, you know, understood about Revelation chapter 12, there's about 10 pages of notes that are attached to the video link on YouTube that you can go back and read and study. So I just encourage you to be a good Berean, you know, Acts chapter 17, the Bereans took everything Paul said. They didn't have a, a resistant heart, but they were like, okay, Paul, what you're saying sounds true, but let me go back into scripture and test out what you're speaking with scripture. And if it's not true, then I'm not going to cling to it. And I would say the same thing with this. Everything that I'm speaking, I just encourage you to go back into scripture, ask the Lord about it, study it yourself, and, um, and just really immerse yourself in Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to give a, a quick review of Revelation chapter 12. And again, there's going to be some things I'm going to fly through just because a lot of that I covered last Sunday. So I'm not going to repeat myself, but just want to, just want to give you um, just a, a quick overview and summary of that. So we'll, we'll start with Revelation chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Just to pause real quick and just to make this one statement, this, what John is seeing in Revelation chapter 12, this revelation John is seeing in Revelation chapter 12 is taking place just prior to the last three and a half years of the age, what scholar, what Jesus called the great tribulation so it's uh, what scholars call the midpoint of the tribulation is that John is viewing what's going to happen right before the last three and a half years of the age. That tells us the timing of when this prophecy is going to take place. And I said this last Sunday, I believe many of us, if not most of us, are going to witness this prophecy take place in our lifetime. So this is not an irrelevant prophecy this is not something like scholars and theologians debate with, you know, smoking pipes and turtlenecks and, you know, seminary rooms about what this means. This is actually very, very relevant to your life. I believe this is beginning to take place now. I mean, obviously we're not there yet, but I believe the formation of what God wants to do in his people to form us into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ is beginning to take place. So just keep that in mind. This is likely... This is likely going to be a prophecy that you're going to experience in your lifetime, and I believe it's one of the greatest prophecies that is yet to be fulfilled in Scripture. It is of utmost importance. And uh, I just believe God is really highlighting right now. The Spirit of the Lord, I believe, is really wanting to highlight right now in this hour, in this day and hour we live in, wanting to highlight Revelation chapter 12. 
So a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, what John is seeing here, you know, I mentioned this last Sunday, this, a lot of theologians and commentators think that he's seeing Israel because of Joseph having that dream of the sun and the moon bowing down to him and the 12 stars. I don't believe that's what is the case. I mentioned that last Sunday. I'm not going to go into it here. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing the church as God sees the church in Christ. Glorious, having authority, and that word crown is the word stephanos in the Greek, and it's a victor's crown, it's an overcomer's crown. In other words, God is, what John has sh uh, uh, shown is he's seeing the church as glorious overcomers with authority. Now, we know that the condition of the church, how many of you really, how many of you know, is, is far from that right now. We're, most of the church is carnal, lukewarm, and soulish. There's a remnant that's not that, and God is raising up a remnant, but a, but a majority of the church is carnal, lukewarm, and soulish. They are not, we're, the, most of the church in America and around the world is not glorious and overcoming, but God is not going to end it that way. Amen? So what, what Paul is seeing here is the church, as God sees the church in Christ, glorious authority and overcomers, and there have also been throughout history in the great cloud of witnesses, those who have overcome, those who have overcome, and I don't mean just being saved, but they have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil in their lives, and they overcame what Jesus listed in Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter 3, and they comprise the beginning of this formation of this woman in heaven. But yet God in this prophecy is going to add to her numbers here at the end of the age. And he's going to do it in three ways. He's going to do it, one, through the birth of a man-child. He's going to do it, second, through the woman fleeing into, the, into places of refuge during the last three and a half years of the age. And he's going to do it, number three, through those who are marked for martyrdom at the hand of the Antichrist. And I mentioned last Sunday, if you're marked for martyrdom, you can do nothing about it to escape it. If you're not marked for it, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so don't get all worried about that right now. But God, this, this is Revelation chapter 12, is showing us how God is going to make the church glorious and authoritative and overcomers at the end of the age. The Lord is not going to have a wimpy, weak, inglorious church when he returns. He will have, as Paul said, a church in all of her glory, holy and blameless, that he will present to Jesus Christ. And we're living in this day. This is the church's finest hour. This is incredible. You know, I, I just, we're living... And I'm not, this is not just preacher talk. I mean this. This, we are living in the church's finest hour. You were born for such a time as this. A lot of times people hear about the end of the age and they're like, oh, it sounds terrible. Just rapture me up. I don't want to be here. My goal in this message, like it was last Sunday, is to make you not want to be raptured out of here. <laughs> you do not want to be raptured out of what God is about to do on the earth. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you want, I mean, the, the great cloud of witnesses are looking down with, you know, godly jealousy upon us because we get to live in this day, in this hour. That's the, that's the day we live in. Okay, so the woman was with child, verse 2, and she cried out, <clears throat> being in labor and in pain to give birth. There was travail going on in the church. There was a man child being formed, a a mature representation of Jesus Christ that looks like and has been conformed into his image and his likeness. Verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And I mentioned last, last week, scholars believe the seven heads are seven kingdoms, historical kingdoms. Well, six that have already been, one that's coming in the future, uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome is number six is Rome. And then number seven would be the revived Roman Empire. So that has yet to be fulfilled. I believe we're living in the days when that is beginning to be fulfilled. I believe it's beginning to be fulfilled through the European Union. I don't believe the European Union is the fulfillment of that. I think it's the beginning of the, the fulfillment of that. We're also seeing it with the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset and the UN's 2030 agenda that's, that's rising up in our day. 
I don't believe that that seventh head has yet been crowned, but we're living in the time when we're moving in to the day when that head is crowned. And so this tells us the timing of when this prophecy takes place. It, it, it is not describing Jesus Christ being born because there would have only been six heads crowned with diadems. It's telling us that when the seventh kingdom is in place and has dominion, then this prophecy will be fulfilled. Make sense? Talked about that last Sunday. All right. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. I believe this is talking about the coming persecution of the church of Jesus Christ during the seventh kingdom, when this Antichrist kingdom rises up. It's, it's before the, the great tribulation. It will happen before the great tribulation. A seventh kingdom is rising up. Uh, Revelation chapter 17, you can read about it. That is, this, this kingdom is rising up and is going to persecute the woman because Satan knows in her womb is a man-child, a mature representation of Jesus Christ that is going to shake this earth and is going to shake the heavens. Amen. Verse 5, And she gave birth to a son, or as the King James Version says, to a man-child. I, I don't like, you know, I don't walk around talking in just normal everyday language, oh, he's a man-child. I mean, it's a very odd term, you know, to even say the man-child. It's just a, I mean, you know, if you think about a man-child, they're usually, you know, a little awkward. But, you know, it's just an awkward, weird term. But I think it is actually really helpful to distinguish the, the overcomers right before the Great Tribulation. So I do use the term. I think it's very helpful. Um, so God, this woman is, is giving birth to a male child or a man child, a mature son. The word son in the Greek is weos, which means a mature son. It's different than technon, which is describing one who is born or one who is, could be immature. But weos is always used or normally used as a mature son. Romans 8.14 uses weos to say, all who were led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. In other words, all that, are, all that live from their spirit with the soul and the body under dominion, with the Holy Spirit rising up and living in them and through them, these are the mature Christ-like weos sons of God. That's Romans 8, 14. All who are led in such a way, who are putting to death the deeds of their body, who are renewing their carnal mind, who are being led by the Spirit, who have the mind of Christ, these are the sons of God. These and only these are the sons of God. You can be born again. You can be a technon. You can have Christ in you, but you can still be carnal. You can still be soulish. You can still be living for yourself and from yourself and, and not be a weos, a mature representation of Jesus Christ. God is going to have in this earth before his son comes back a mature representation of Jesus Christ in the earth. We are sons of God who've been conformed into the image of Jesus. I want to be part of that. I hope you do too. I want to see the Father look at me and say, that is my beloved Son. He sees Christ in me. I don't want anything of self in me any longer. I want Christ to have dominion and possession of every single part of me. I want to be part of this. It's too incredible not to be part of this. And so... Um, her, her, the man-child, the son, was who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's a direct quote. So when you're interpreting this passage, the candidates are, are either Jesus Christ or the overcoming church. There's only two candidates. So, and I, I've, I've shared many times, well, I don't believe this is Christ. I'm not going to rehash that here. But it's as, if you look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, Jesus said to the church of Thyatira, if you overcome Jezebel... I will give you the rod of iron and you will rule the nations with the rod of iron. So what is in the womb of the church are the overcomers who have overcome what Jesus listed in Revelation 2 and 3, losing your first love, fear of, of, of death, compromise with uh, doctrines of devils and demons, Jezebel, apathy, lukewarmness, lukewarmness, that is a huge one, losing your first love, that is a huge one. 
that we will battle with all the days of our life, especially in this uh, nation we live in, in America, we live in, in the Western world we live in, where we can get anything we want at any time, basically. It, it creates this lukewarm self-satisfaction in our hearts where our hearts for God don't burn. And so we've got to overcome lukewarmness and indifference and that apathy that would settle in where we are we, we lack that hunger and that thirst for God. And the overcomer is going to overcome lukewarmness and indifference at the end of the age. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, I mentioned in the last session why I don't believe this particular uh, wording here, this particular word, caught up to God and to his throne, is a rapture like, you know, the Left Behind series where you're raptured out and you escape the trouble that's coming. I don't believe that word here is the word harpazo, which is used in three ways. Number one, it was used to describe Philip being translated. You know, when Philip was in one location, the Lord harpazo him to another location. He was translated. So it's, it's speaking of a translation. It was also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul was harpazo to the third heaven and to paradise where he heard things he couldn't explain. So Paul was caught up to God and to his throne. And then the third way it's used is like, like when you say the rapture, what we think of as the rapture, the catching up of the church at the coming of Jesus Christ to escape the tribulation, that's the other way this is used. I don't believe this particular verse is describing a rapture that causes a church to escape. And I, I went into the details last Sunday. I won't rehash it here. Um, but the reason I believe that is, is, uh, is, is verse 6. So verse 5, verse 6, they, they, they form. I want you to just go back and read this. Read this and ask the Lord about this. But verse 6, it says, Then the woman, when, after the, the man-child is caught up to God and to his throne, right before the last three and a half years start, in fact, this catching up is is how the last three and a half years start. They don't start until there's a, a representation and a remnant of God's people in the church who have Christ formed in them, who have overcome, who live by the Spirit, until they are caught up to God into his throne. The last three and a half years of the age will not start. It starts when there is this remnant of first fruits has been completed. And now it says, Then the woman fled in the church, fled into the wilderness. This is probably you know, 30 days, 60 days after verse 5. We don't know the exact time frame, but it's a short, very short time. The woman flees, and, flees into the wilderness. I don't believe it's actually, I, I don't believe it's in every single instance it's going to be a desert. I think it's more speaking of cities of refuge. There's going to be cities of refuge. There's going to be states of refuge. There's going to be nations of refuge. And uh, so verse 6 says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. And I mentioned last Sunday that if this, the, the word nourished, uh, or, so she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days, three and a half years. And I mentioned last Sunday that this word nourished is the third person plural, so it should literally read, and they fed her for three and a half years. 1260 days. So the question would be, okay, well, who, ha who is the one feeding her? So let me give you, let me give you an example, just, just a basic English example here to help us understand. Okay, who is the they? So it says the woman was, she fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that they would uh, nourish her or feed her. So just consider this sentence that, okay, so just for example, just take this sentence. Jessica has, and I'm sorry if I sound like a third grade English teacher, but hopefully this makes sense. Jessica has a garden, and she saw, you know, no, I'm just kidding, but Jessica has a garden, and the Kessler brothers, Brian, Michael, John, and Stephen, helped her plant tomato seeds. When the tomatoes became ripe, they helped Jessica pick tomatoes. Who is they? Okay, is that complicated? Huh? The, the four brothers, the Kesslers, okay? Is that complicated? Okay. That's third grade English or whatever grade it is. It's, it's very, very simple. 
There's a sentence that tells who the subject is, and then they use a pronoun, they, and it becomes <laughs> very clear who that is, right? And it's not complicated. Huh? That's correct. That's correct, Michelle? Okay. Yeah, you're an English teacher. So I did terrible in English. I, did, I was way better in math, and now God's using me to write books. Go figure. So I made C's in English. I hated English. I don't think I ever read a book in high school once. I read Cliff Notes. I hope Anna's not listening. But I hated it, and I, I just, I mean, I, my freshman year in college, I hired a tutor because this is way off the subject, but we had this, we had to write this paper called Ode to a Grecian Urn, and, and I mean, it was like, I had to write like a five-page paper, and the poem was like this big. I'm like, I can't even comprehend what's going on here. I have no idea what this is about. I got to write a five-page paper, and I hired a tutor, and I don't know, I ended up getting a C. I, so I made C's in English. I'm terrible in English, but I'm smart enough in English to know that they, in that sentence, refers to the Kessler brothers. That same kind of grammatical dynamic if that's even a word, uh, is going on here in verse 5 and 6. So go back and look at it here. <laughs> she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Okay? In our example, she would be like Jessica who planted tomato seeds. Okay? The, the child would be like the Kessler brothers in our example. Verse 6, these, these two verses go right hand in hand together. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that they, okay, in our example, the Kessler brothers, the man-child, would nourish her for 1,260 days. That's, that is one reason why I don't believe this catching up is a rapture that takes us out before the Great Tribulation. I think it's talking about this man-child that is born is going to be the one who takes care of the bride in cities of refuge because God is going to bring the greatest number of his people uh, into a place of readiness through the fires of the great tribulation. Daniel, Daniel talks about this. I think it's Daniel 12 verse 10, I believe. I believe it's uh, somewhere in Daniel 12, he says that he said, many are going to be made white. Many are going to be purified. Many are going to be refined. The greatest number of people in the, in the church who are going to be made ready for Jesus Christ. You know, Revelation 19, 7 says, the bride has made herself ready. The greatest number of people in history that are going to be made ready at this, is going to be in this last three and a half years and the Lord is going to have friends of the bridegroom. And these friends of the bridegroom, this man-child company, are going to be friends of the bridegroom. And they're the ones that are going to nourish her, feed her in the places of refuge. You're called, we're called to be part of this man-child company that experiences this catching up. Now, let's, let's turn to, to uh, Revelation chapter 4. Are you, are you with me? So... You with me? Are you still thinking about tomato seeds and ode to a Grecian urn? Come back. Okay, Revelation chapter 4. John, what, I'm gonna, what I want you to see is John is the prototype and the model of what Revelation 12, 5 is going to be like. John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, After these things... I looked, and, I, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Now, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. It's exactly what, what Paul experienced in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, where he says, whether in the body, I mean, think about this. The Apostle Paul, the brilliant Apostle Paul, who wrote so much of the New Testament, he couldn't even describe whether he was in the body, out of the body. I don't know is what he was saying. I don't know whether it was in the body, out of the body. I don't know. I've never experienced this before. But I was caught up to paradise. I was caught up to the third heaven. This is the, the same thing John experienced, and even those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture use that verse to say, see, aha, the church is going to be raptured out of here before the trouble hits. And so even the pre-tribulation rapture uh, 
uh, proponents use that verse of scripture to say that, I, but I believe what it is showing us is John being the prototype of this man-child company that is going to be called up to God and to his throne. They're not going to, however it fully works out, and I don't think anyone knows exactly how is it actually going to work exactly. We don't know exactly how it's going to work, but it's not something that leaves us in heaven for the last three and a half years. We come back from that. Okay, and then, and then those that, in that company are going to feed and nourish the church in the, the wilderness or in places of refuge. Make sense? Okay, hopefully. That word nourish in Revelation 12, 6 is derived from the word nourish in Ephesians 5, 29, where Paul said that Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. That word nourish in Ephesians 20, 5, 29 means to nourish up to maturity. One of the definitions is to nourish up to maturity. So what we see here is, is not only, you know, you think, you read it in the New King James Version, and it says they will feed her. It almost sounds like all they're going to do is have a soup kitchen and feed the bride in the wilderness. <laughs> and you're like, if that's the case, I just want to stay up in heaven. But that's not really what it's meaning. It's meaning more... They're going to raise the bride up in the wilderness to a place of maturity. The man-child has matured before the majority of the body of Christ has matured. Therefore, they are going to, uh, they're going to mature the church in the wilderness during the last three and a half years of the age. That's, that's the, the idea of what's going on in that passage. Make sense? Okay, so now I want to talk about the ministry of the man-child is what this ministry of the man-child will be like in its last three and a half years of the age. Is, now, I want you to turn to Revelation, or just, just scroll down a little bit, to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Revelation 12, verse 10. After there's a, after there's a battle in the heavens, John hears a loud voice in heaven. Okay, well, who is this loud voice in heaven? Is it angels? Is it cherubim? Is it watchers? Is it the elders? Who is it? Okay, well, I'll answer that in one second, but listen to what they say. Actually, let me answer it real quick. Verse 11 tells us, and they overcame them. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. That word love their lives is actually love their suke, love their soul. And this doesn't necessarily mean they're martyrs. It means they did not love their soul life even if that meant death. In other words, they were not living for themselves. They were completely living for Jesus Christ. So John tells us, verse 11, the overcomers are the ones in verse 10 that are saying in a loud voice what they're about to proclaim. Does that make sense? It's the overcomers here that are in a loud voice. Those overcomers would be the overcomers throughout history, plus the overcomers in the man-child caught up to God into his throne. So this is taking place in heaven. Now listen to this. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, this is really, really interesting. When you dig into the Greek here, when you dig into the Greek here, what this is actually talking about is it, the, the word now means just now, at this very moment, at this very time, at this very moment, salvation has come, power has come, authority has come, the kingdom of God has come. Now, if you look at the word come in the Greek, it means a to become, to come into existence, to begin to be. It also means to arise, appear in history, come onto the stage. It talks about men appearing in public, but it, can, it also means signifying a change of condition, state, or place. So what we have here, I like to say it like this. Psalm 110.3 says, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. What we're seeing here in Revelation 12, verse 10, is the day of God's power. 
In other words, I believe, with, I believe without compromising the scriptures, you could say the loud voice in heaven says, now the day of God's power, Psalms 110 verse 3, has come. And you've been hearing about this for years. If you've been in the charismatic prophetic movement, the day of God's power, the day of God's power, you want to volunteer because there's coming a day of God's power. How many have, have heard that before? Okay, at least some people... Those that have ears to hear, no, I'm kidding. Just kidding. Okay. What, and, and, and basically in Revelation 12, 10, the overcomers are making a prophetic declaration. The day of God's power has come. And that, that, that arrival of that day of power is not going to leave and it's going to only increase until the second coming of Jesus Christ. The last three and a half years are going to be the greatest time of God's power we've ever experienced in the earth. Anything, even beyond, even what's written in the Bible. It's going to exceed that time. God is going to have a man-child who operates in the powers of the age to come. I just encourage you to go back and, and study this. Dig into the Greek and look at that. But they're basically saying this prophetic proclamation now the day of your power has come. And the first act of that power is Satan and his angels are cast down out of heaven. Now the angels, Michael and his angels do that, but it's because that day of power has come that the eviction of Satan and his angels takes place. So this man-child company who's caught up to God and to his throne, they are going to come back and they're going to have the salvation and the deliverance of Jesus Christ. They're going to lead a great harvest. The greatest harvest in history is going to be reaped in the last three and a half years. Revelation 7 talks about, I saw a multitude which no one could count standing before the throne of God. They had white robes on and they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and they were crying out, Hosanna, salvation to him who sits on the throne. The greatest number of people who've ever been born again is going to happen in that last three and a half years. This man-child company is going to lead an incredible uh, harvest of the ingathering of Jesus Christ into the kingdom of God. And the power, dunamis, the powers of the age to come. When this day of power arrives, the powers of the age to come are going to begin to operate in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I know we've got a taste of it. I mean, you know, I know that in the charismatic movement, in the Pentecostal movement, we've had a taste of the power of God. We've experienced it to some degree. This is on an entirely different level. This is end of the age type stuff. This is reserved the best wine, you know, the best wine for last, so to speak. This is, this is a power that's greater than what the book of Acts experienced. This is what Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. John 14, 12. They are, this company is going to operate in the powers of the age to come. I want to be part of that. Lord, let it not be a rapture that takes us out of here. That's the way, when you read this, you're like, oh, I want to be part of this. And the kingdom of our God has now come. Now, obviously that doesn't mean the kingdom of God has come in fullness. The fullness of the kingdom doesn't come until Jesus comes back. Three and a half years later, Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. But the, 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 an, an increase, this, this goes to a whole other level when the kingdom of God has come. And the authority of his Christ, this man-child company is going to walk in authority like we haven't seen in, in many, many years, going all the way back to the Bible. That man-child company is going to walk in the authority of Christ on the earth. And so, just if you, if you have some time, I just would encourage you, study Psalm chapter 10, Psalm 110, and Revelation chapter 12, because they, they go together. They're really the same uh, prophetic experience that's taking place. So I mentioned last Sunday that, I mentioned Howard Pittman, um, and I highly recommend that you, you, you look at his book, Placebo. But in, 1970, in 1979, Howard Pittman had a near-death experience. So Howard Pittman was a Baptist minister. 
I don't even, I don't think he even believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But, but Howard Pittman was a Baptist minister and he had a near-death experience. He, his soul came out of his body. He was pronounced legally dead in an ambulance. His soul comes up out of his body, stands before the Lord. The Lord gives him five messages for the end time church. Now, one of the, now the, keep in mind, this is not a prophetic experience. This is, he's dead. He's clinically dead. He's standing before the Lord, and the Lord gives him five messages. Point number five of this message talks about an Elijah army that God is going to raise up at the last days. He goes through and he talks about it, and I'm just going to highlight just a, a few of the points that there is coming an Elijah army. God is going to raise up an Elijah army. He's recruiting an Elijah army that is going to produce, the, produce great miracles that will shake the so-called religion. These soldiers are being recruited, and they're going to demonstrate the power of God to a greater extent than the, than the disciples in the Pentecostal age. They will even do uh, works that compare with what Elijah did. Now, this is, this is, again, this is not prophetic experience. This is Jesus telling him in an idle body, dead, you know, he's dead, telling him this directly. This is the Lord speaking. I, I believe what, what Howard is seeing here is he's seeing that day of power I just mentioned. This Elijah army that's being, that's being raised up. Is, is that there's a lot in the notes, I'm not going to go through this, but John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah, and he, di he didn't even know it, is what Howard was saying. That, but this army is going to have the spirit of Elijah. They're going to operate in greater works than these that, that Jesus talked about. That there's going to be the greatest miracles, the greatest demonstrations of power that we have ever seen on the earth, including written in the Bible. In other words, those things written in the Bible are all going to come together in one incredible crescendo at the end of the age where this army of Elijah, this Elijah army operates in that kind of power. Biblical level power and authority. He goes on to say in that... That, that God right now is, is gathering together, training this army. But he mentioned this. He said, there is going to be a culling, a culling, a, a, a uh, pruning of this army. That, that the, you have to qualify for this army. This is not something you can just say, oh, I want to do it and, and, and not prepare yourself. It's going to be a Gideon's army that God is going to test. God is going to train. God is going to you know, say, okay, are you in? You know, are you compromised? Are you living for yourself? Or, you know, really there's going to be a test that's going to winnow out the, the lukewarm and the selfish and the, and the carnal out of this army. And, and that's what Howard was shown. So another near-death experience, Bob Jones in 1975. Again, this is not a prophetic experience. This is a near-death experience. His soul came out of his body. He stood before the Lord, and the Lord was asking. He saw people, and, and uh, the Lord was at, he saw people coming and stand before the Lord, and the Lord was asking him, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? As he's coming back down into his body, um, he begins to see, he overhears two angels that said, in Truman Stadium, there's going to be 50,000 people that gather. And the other angel said, well, that's only a tithe of what's going to be gathering in Washington, D.C. And so Bob Jones prophesied that, and it came to pass, uh, I think in the, the 80s, I believe. It came to pass, I think Billy Graham, maybe. I don't know exactly the details, but it came to pass. But then this is not really my point. My point is the, the last thing Bob Jones was told in the near-death experience is that every biblical gift is going to be restored at the end of the age. Every biblical gift, like, like what you see in Daniel, like what you see in Elijah, like what you see in John or the apostles, like what you saw in Jesus, that is going to be restored at the end of the age. And I believe it's this day, when this day of power arrives in Revelation chapter 12, when the man child is caught up to God into his throne, now the day of power has come. This is not something, you know, charismatic Pentecostals, we love our miracles, we love our power, we love all the gifts, we love all that stuff. People want to go out and try to create this. You can't create this. 
Again, we were talking to our leaders in, um, in a couple weeks ago when they were saying, you know, our leaders are a lot of churches in Uganda. They want to try to uh, create the, or, you know, try to cause John chapter 14, 12 to come to pass. The greater works than these that Jesus did. And he said, it just gets really fleshly, really, really weird, really, really quick. This is something, if we want this, it's not to pray for more power, it's not to pray for revival. That's coming, it's prophesied. What needs to happen is the formation of Jesus Christ within a remnant of his people. That is what our prayers for revival should be about. God is going to answer those prayers. God is going to have a revival, he's already said it. If we really want that day of power to come, what we should be praying for is that God would form Christ in a people, that they would be a people who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They would be a people who are not soulish and selfish. They would be a people of humility. They would be a people who love Jesus and are like, you know, if I don't work, perform any miracles, it doesn't really matter, Lord. I love you. I'm in love with you. I'm not in it for the miracles. I'm not in it for the power. If you want me to move in that, that's cool. But I'm not in it for that. I'm in it because I love you. That's the kind of people God is raising up in this day and age. And he's going to shake this world with the greatest power, even greater than the book of Acts. Even greater than the book of Acts. Well, how do you know it's greater than the book of Acts? I want you to turn to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Oh, one thing Howard, Pinchin, Howard Pittman mentioned was this army, this Elijah army is going to lead the latter rain revival. Let me, let me just read what he said, quote it. You who are to be chosen are to be the soldiers of the latter rain as referred to in Scripture. This recruitment is for the end of the great revival spoken of by, by the prophet Joel and began on the day of Pentecost. It only began on the day of Pentecost. It ends before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. The end time of that great revival is the beginning of the latter rain. So you must prepare for the battle with the discipline of a professional soldier. So now Joel 2.28, and, and you were all familiar with this. If you've been in the charismatic movement for any bit of time, this is probably our favorite scripture. But Joel 2.28 talks about the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, he mentioned the early rain, Pentecost, and the latter rain, the end times, the, the last three and a half years of this age. And he says that it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. But you're probably saying, well, didn't that already happen at Pentecost? Yes, but only as a down payment. How do you know that? Look at the next verse. It's a continuation of this prophecy. It hasn't ended. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the awesome day of the Lord comes. Do you see that? That revival, that latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is, comes right before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. It's, it's actually describing the, the sixth seal in Revelation 6 when the sun grows dark and the moon is turned into blood and the day of the Lord's wrath has come and the men are fleeing into caves saying, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb for the day of His wrath has come and who is able to stand? At that time... Even preceding that time is going to be the greatest revival the world has ever known. The greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit the world has ever known. Greater than Pentecost. Miracles greater than Pentecost. Power greater than Pentecost. The powers of the age to come. An Elijah army throughout the whole world is going to be operating in the signs and wonders to give testimony to Jesus Christ in the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit ever. 
and you want to be raptured. You want to escape that. Okay, maybe the Lord will let you, but it won't be in a rapture. I want to be part of that. I hope you do too. My and it's like, this is my vision. This is my life vision. I want to be part of this. I can't even, I can't even imagine how, you know, and, and again, I'm not trying to make the last three and a half years sound rosy. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard, okay? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be the best of times and the worst of times. It's going to be glorious in the church. It's going to be the church's finest hour in the world. It's going to be terrible, okay? The darkness we've seen rising up is nothing compared to the darkness that will come in this last time period. But God is going to have a mature representation of his son in the earth. Just like Jesus walked the, or just like Jesus had a three and a half year ministry and it began with the father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God will have a company of people, a corporate people, the sons of God who have matured before the majority and they are the man child. They graduate from the school of sonship unto adoption to the throne of God and they hear the father say, these are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased and they will come out of that experience with the greatest power this world has ever known, an Elijah army that will prepare the way of the Lord, that will, that will mature the bride in places of refuge. Lord, help us. You know, you've read about the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Many think it's Moses and Elijah. Others have said that perhaps even other Old Testament saints will be a part of this great in time move of God. You know, however that all works out, I, I don't really know exactly how it's going to work. We'll see. We'll see how, what it's going to look like. I just know if God would grant me, I want to be part of that. You're called to be part of that. Don't just look at this and go, as for this elite super group of Christians and I'll never be a part of that. No. If God's spirit dwells inside of you, he can do it in you. The problem is your lukewarmness and indifference. You don't really care. I want to stir you up that you would care. I want to stir you up to say, more than anything else in my life, I want to be a part of this army God is raising up at the end of the age. Lord, would you grant me a work so deep in my heart and in my soul to conform me into the image of Christ that I might be part of these friends of the bridegroom, this Elijah company you're raising up at the end of the age. Now let's turn to Malachi chapter, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Also very important, describes this as well. The coming of Elijah. I'm going to send Elijah. I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm just going to paraphrase that. I'm going to send Elijah before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And I don't believe this will be just one person, Elijah, this is talking about. I believe it's a company of people anointed with the spirit of Elijah. But in verse 1, it talks about 4.1, it talks about, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, But for those who fear my name, the son of righteousness. This is not S-O-N, it's S-U-N. The son of righteousness. It's kind of like the morning star. I don't believe this is talking about Jesus in his bodily form doing this. I believe it's more of the son of righteousness arising up within his people. And we saw the context is at the end of the age. The son of righteousness rising up with healing in its wings and you will go about and skip about like calves from the stall. There's coming a healing movement unlike anything we've ever seen. And you and me were called to be part of that. I mean, I hardly have an anointing right now to heal a headache. 
Now, some people, yeah, it's not good. I'm not arguing. It's not good. I don't want it to be like that. But there's coming, a, there's coming a, a, an end time move of healing unlike anything we've ever known. You know, we've kind of been in this lull of healing where there's, you know, maybe one out of a hundred times or two out of a hundred times or if you go to someone who's really anointed, 10 out of 100 times, someone gets healed or whatever. The end of the age is not going to be like that. There's going to be a company of people operating in the powers of the age to come unlike we've ever seen. And I was listening to Neville Johnson this week, and he described an encounter he had in heaven where he was taken into a, to a room. And in this room, he saw body parts like... Uh, hearts and livers and kidneys and other, other body parts. And he was like, what is this? And the Lord was like, this is reserved for the end of the age in a healing movement. Talking about Malachi 4, verse 2. The son of righteousness is going to rise up with healing in his wings. We are called into this. This is going to be, you know, again, the world around us is going to be shaking <laughs> But this is going to be incredible. God is going to have a testimony of his son. The devil is going to have his representatives. The Antichrist, the false prophet, the ten kings, the harlot Babylon, the nations who take the mark of the beast and worship him. He's going to have the economic system. But God is also going to have his representatives. We've got to see this. God is not just going to leave the church on the earth, you know, fleeing for their lives and not, not provide. God is going to have an army, an Elijah army at this time that is going to have the greatest power that we've ever seen. I want to be part of that. I hope you want to be part of that as well. Now, that's the ministry of the man-child. Let's talk just for a minute about the glory of the man-child. And when I say glory, I don't mean like the man-child is going to be glor glorified and receive glory. I mean the man-child is going to have the glory of God radiating from them. And I mentioned last Sunday, the morning star. Let's, let's look at it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 28. Is, is Jesus said to the overcomers, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 28, he said, I will give you the morning star. In Revelation 22, 16, Jesus said, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Jesus Christ is the morning star. Jesus Christ is going to give the morning star not to every single born-again believer, He's going to give the morning star to those within the church who overcome. To the spiritual believers, to the mature believers, to those who have, a, who have become a mature representation of Jesus Christ, conformed into his image, led by the Spirit, putting their flesh to death. They are going to be given the morning star. Well, what is the morning star? What does it signify? Well, back in the biblical days, it was the planet Venus that dawn, uh, it, was, it was the planet Venus that signaled the dawning of a new day. In other words, right, and you probably have seen it, I've seen it, right before morning, it's, you know, four, five in the morning, you look up and you see the planet Venus and it's shining bright in the dark sky and it's signaling morning is coming. God is going to give to the overcomer, to this man child, the morning star, and they are going to have Christ rising up within them in fullness. Again, it's not the absolute fullness of Christ because the heavens and the earth would flee away, but it's the fullness of Christ and our capacity, not having resurrected bodies, it's the fullness of Christ and our present condition, our present bodies, that we, the fullness that we could possibly contain is going to be given to the overcomers. And the morning star is going to rise up within them and they are going to shine forth the light of God at the darkest moment in history. And it's going to be a prophetic signal that the dawning of a new day is coming. The millennial kingdom is coming when Jesus comes to rule the earth with a rod of iron, with his bride, with his overcomers. And so this morning star, I think about it like this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 
you can read about it. But Paul, was, Paul was just kind of looking at Moses. And he's like, Moses had this glory. I mean, Moses came out of the mountain shining with such a glory that the sons of Israel had to put the, a veil over their faces because otherwise Moses would blind them. And Mo, you, can, you can hear Paul reading. Paul's like, if Moses had this glory, how much more, that was under the law. How much more the ministry of the Spirit will have even a greater glory. And you could read it from Paul. Paul has not experienced that yet. You can read the language. He says, we have this hope. I believe that's going to be fulfilled here at the end of the age in this company of overcomers who have the morning star. The, the light of God is going to emanate out of them. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate it. It's not the same as when we have our resurrection bodies and we shine like the sun in its strength. It's not like that, but it is significant, very significant. It's, the, it's Isaiah chapter 60, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. Deep darkness will cover the earth, but God will appear upon you and shine upon you, and his glory will arise and appear upon you. That is going to be fulfilled in his people the last three and a half years of this age. We are going to shine the morning star, the brightness of the morning star. Again, it's not going to be like the sun that's coming in, at the resurrection of the dead, but it's going to be significant. Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon talks about the, the uh, who is this? I think it's Song of Solomon 6.10. Who is this that grows like the dawn? Actually, let me read it. I'm going to totally butcher it. So, Song of Solomon 6.10. I love this scripture, by the way. Talking about the bride. Six ten. Who is this that grows like the dawn? Notice the growing. Notice like notice the growing like the dawn. Sounds like the morning star. Growing like the dawn. In other words, the morning star shining, but the light is growing like the dawn. As beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun. So you get this idea of the bride progressively going from glory to glory, radiating and shining forth light and glory. And as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners. That's the overcomers. It's the overcoming bride. An army with banners. They have conquered the enemy and they've staked their victory into the ground, and they have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Who is this that grows like the dawn? As beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners. That is going to be fulfilled here at the end of the age in a company of people, the man-child, who are the first fruits of the harvest, who will then impart it to the church in cities of refuge, states of refuge, places of refuge, to prepare the church, much like Moses prepared the church in the wilderness. These will be like Moses's all over the world, preparing the church in the wilderness in places of refuge to be the bride of Jesus Christ for all eternity. The morning star is rising up. The morning star is rising up. The glory of God is rising up. And the question is, do you want to be part of this army? I, I absolutely want to be part of this. None of us know exactly when it's going to happen. But Psalms 110 verse 3 says that your people volunteer freely in the day of your power. I want God to do that work in me, and I'm sure you do as well. So let's pray and ask the Lord to do that work in us. Lord, we just come to you right now.
Lord, I, I pray that we would get a revelation of this, Lord. Lord, where we have been so entrenched with the awful things that are happening, going to happen in the last three and a half years, and that, a lot of it's true, we have just developed a mindset, a paradigm of it being so terrible, but yet there is going to be a glorious, great side to it of power, revival that we've never seen. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that you would do that work of preparation. Lord, where this man-child is formed into maturity in the womb and is born mature. Lord, that, that work of preparation that is done, that, that crucifying of the flesh, the crucifying of the self-life. Lord, that training to live by the Spirit, how to, of living from the indwelling life of Christ, of living from that place of union with the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you train us? Would you equip us? Lord, would you bring your sword that divides soul from spirit? And Lord, would you cut away the pride and cut away the arrogance, the independence, the rebellion, the self-life, Lord, that, dis that distorts your glory in us, Lord. Everything of the soul that, Lord, we still live by, that we still cling to of self-life, soul life, Lord, that is just the natural man operating, Lord, would you bring that to that place of crucifixion? Lord, that we might be fully possessed with your spirit. Lord, give us that vision of that, Lord, and put a hunger inside of us, Lord, that we would want this more than anything else, Lord. I pray, Lord, even do a work of triggering hunger in us, Lord, we would be, Lord, triggered by a, a, this new, fresh desire to say, Lord, we want to volunteer freely in this day of your power. Prepare us, Lord. Prepare us. Lord, we want to be those people that you want us to be. We pray that, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So before we close the online session, just remember we have Terry Bennett and Josiah Bennett coming next uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Just want to encourage you all to either, you know, if you go to this church, then definitely be here um, for all the sessions. And if you are not on watching online, I want to encourage you to watch. I believe the timing of this is very significant, as you know that, you know, the, the, the prophets, the prophetic revelation he has been given starting back in 2000, he got the revelation in 2001 of the seven periods of, or three periods of seven years that started in 2008 with economic shaking, 2015 government shaking, 2022 is, is, is he believes is going to begin in, uh, in September. And so, we, you know, Hikari comes the month before that happens. Um, it's a very significant time, I believe. It's a very, very significant time. Um, and, it, you know, that prophecy, is, if you've tracked it, has come to pass with very much accurate, very much precise. So we're entering into that final seven-year period that the Lord revealed to Terry um, in September, and here we are, August, and, you know, the one month before. So I, I say that to say that the timing of this thing is, is very significant. So just want to encourage you to block off your schedule to, to really, really just let the Lord do a great work. We need it. I need it. We need the Lord to do a great work. So amen. Just join in and come in person, and, you know, we'll end the online portion here. Have a blessed week. Amen. Let's stand real quick and give the Lord a praise.